Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And I'm Claire Mansell in Ottawa, Canada. Welcome to Dog Edition. Where voices from around the world consider all things dog. Dog Edition is the first show designed for you to listen to while you walk your dogs. And you know, Jim, I am particularly excited about this episode today because a few years ago, I used to be quite into entering competitions. And on this episode, we're going to tell you guys how you can potentially win five thousand dollars five thousand dollars from dog podcast network so here at dpm we have been searching for 101 dog tales audio packages that we can share with our listeners so different stories about dog related subjects from around the world and on today's show we'll be telling you about how you can enter that and how you can win a hundred dollars and possibly that top prize of five thousand dollars That's right. We have $15,000 in prize money. We'll tell you more about that later. We'll also be listening to the entry of our first winner, Lisa Clevermark, who hails from Sweden. Lisa shares a 23-day road trip through Europe from the perspective of her golden retriever, Ellie. That and a lot more on today's show. So if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's take a walk because we've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey, Pepper, want to go for a walk? So we will tell you about how you can win some of that $15,000 in prize money and Claire, whatever contests you want. I want to hear about those. But first, let's hear about Ellie. Ellie is a dog, a collie golden retriever who lives in Europe. And this is her journey traveling from Northern Europe to Southern Europe and back. My parents were loading the car to go somewhere. I flopped down on the terrace feeling gloomy. It didn't look like there was room for me. Every dog's nightmare is to be left behind by the pack. But soon, a magic call came from my father. Come Ellie girl, let's go, hop in the car. My father, who smelled of jam, butter and burnt toast, switched on the radio and started the engine. Have you got her passport? He asked my mother. She smelled of sweet moisturizer and sweat. I watched her rummage in her bag and pull out a dark booklet with a circle of stars on the cover. Inside it was a picture of me, so proper, She couldn't imagine there would be any problems during our trip. But I knew there were times of year, like now, when my wavy black coat sheds so much I become like an outcast. Did I still look like the majestic nine-and-a-half-year-old collie retriever in the picture? Maybe no one would let me inside the places my parents were going. I'd have to wait outside tied to lampposts watching pigeons or curled up like a cat in the car. My mother sighed as she put the passport back in her bag. We'd surely be fine in Scandinavia, but how the Germans, French and Italians would react to the shedding, panting, salivating me was anyone's guess. We crossed border after border. But a strange thing happened. No one seemed to care about my passport. Whenever my mother tried to show it, no one even looked at it. They just smiled and winked and waved at me through the window. At the gas station, a friendly woman even suggested some vitamins to stop my shedding. We travelled further and further into the light and the hills. The luscious scents of cow manure from grasses and wildflowers were different than at home. Not once was I tied up outside or stuck alone in the car. Everywhere humans welcomed me with words I had never heard before, but understood with my heart. They gave me bowls of water. They scratched my belly and they filled it with delicious fatty sausage and crusty bread dipped in tasty oil I wasn't usually allowed to have. 
One day, my father and I got lost on a walk. We kept passing the same vineyards and duck farms. We were going in circles. But then we passed some firemen who were rescuing a whining cat stuck in a tree. Imagine my satisfaction when they interrupted the rescue to drive us home. Another time, we stopped in a tavern. I sniffed the spirits of dogs that had come before me over centuries. Some toothless old men were downing strong-smelling drinks which made them laugh so hard I couldn't help but wag my tail. In response, they breathed their warm breath over me and petted me with their big, hardened hands. As we were heading back into the cold, dark north, a policeman knelt on the platform at a subway station and kissed me on the head. He complimented me on the silkiness of my ears. After that, my mother and father called him a Great Dane. As we were nearing home, they had stopped talking about Scandinavians, Germans, Frenchmen and Italians. They just thought of everyone as good Europeans. Maybe that was like being a German Shepherd, a French Bulldog, or one of those yappy Italian dogs that sits in a handbag, or a Collie Retriever. In the end, we're all just good dogs. So, Jim, did you just drop that package in there? Because you know that really I'm feeling quite sad about leading Canada, but you're just opening up the possibilities of travelling in Europe with my dog to me. Exactly. Because I want Maple and you and your whole family to feel the reconnection from North America back to Europe, although I guess Britain really isn't part of Europe. No, I hey, know it hey, is. hey, it's part of Europe. It's just not part of the EU, but let's not go the there. <laughs> Let's not go there. Do you know, it made me think about when I lived in Germany and um, the Germans are incredibly dog friendly. And I remember walking into a restaurant one evening and having to step over an enormous Great Pyrenean that was just lying across the restaurant floor. And, you know, the waiter just didn't even react at all to the fact that we just had to, like, step over this huge dog to get to our table because it's just part of how it is. It's just a guest. Yeah. That's what I love when I travel in Europe and, and how each country is a little different. But it's so wonderful how accommodating Europeans are in general to dogs. And I love the idea of a pet passport that you can you know, enable you to easily bring your, your dog, because well, this is dogs, uh, from one country to another. Yeah, and I think there's been a few changes with that. So we're going to do a little report on that later on in this episode, aren't we, to find out how it's impacting people, particularly if you're traveling from the UK to Europe and back from Europe to the UK. It does change constantly, actually, regardless of Brexit, because we've moved around a few countries. And I know that in our time doing that, every two years, we're constantly checking and something slightly has changed every time. So you do have to be on the case with it. It was such an imaginative piece from Ellie's perspective, and it was submitted to us by the production team of Julie Lindau, uh, Lisa Clevermark, Katie Lee, Katz, I think that's how you pronounce it, Katz, Laszlau, and Dominic Kramer. They were the first winners of our 101 Dog Stories contest, and as we talked about at the top of the show, you can also submit audio packages to be included and win your share of $15,000 in prize money. And we're so excited to, to open this up to all of our listeners. And I just want to share, before we delve into the details of this competition, how worthwhile it is entering competitions. Because I think people too easily say, oh, I never win competitions. There's no point in me entering. But a few years ago, I used to be very into entering competitions. And I took it quite Seriously, it's probably not the word, but I was quite dedicated to it. Uh -huh. And I would go searching for competitions like this. This would totally have fitted the bill for me, where you have to put a bit of creative energy and thought into entering the competition. So there's a there's a challenge. It's not like scrolling down your Facebook page and seeing one of those, you can win an RV from this fake page if you just put this word in the comments, right. where like 10,000 people have commented. 
there, you know, there is a little barrier. You have to make some effort. Mm -hmm. But in all likelihood, if you make that effort, you'll probably be, you know, you have a quite high chance of being one of our winners. So in my time when I was a comper, as we are known. Comper? <laughs> a comper, I did, yeah. I, did, I didn't know that. I didn't know that's there was a, a term. Comper. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a thing. Okay. Um, I won all our garden furniture, which I think was about wow. four thousand pounds worth of garden furniture. Nice. Um, which I won. What did you do to win? What was the contest that you won the garden furniture with? Um, it was you had to kind of design a garden makeover and you had to like write a blog post about your garden. So again, oh. you know, like there's a little bit of effort, a little bit creative, creative you yeah. know, and I and I also I made a video as well. They didn't ask for a video, <laughs> but I made a video because it was literally you just, went over and above. Yeah, like a selfie video. So it was quite quick. It was like a minute long video. This is why I want to win, and then I won it. Um I won a hotel stay. I won a five hundred pound Amazon voucher. Wow! And that was amazing because it just dropped into my inbox one day. I was just doing something, and and this email just appeared. And my first thought was, "This must be a mistake." And then it was like, "No, that that is actually my money." And somebody who enters this competition, a similar thing will happen to them, where somebody will you know call them or email them from the DPN. And so you've won five thousand dollars, and what a life-changing email or call that could be, and that that could be somebody, yeah. So it's amazing. Absolutely, we are looking as we grow Dog Podcast Network to attract creators who love dogs from all over the globe to be a part of our team, and that's really the the idea behind how One Hundred and One Dog Stories started. And so I want to know a little bit more about this because you know, obviously, you've got my my comp mind buzzing, and I and I need to know mm-hmm. what what we have to do for, to fulfill this. So we're looking for audio packages, mm-hmm. aren't we? How long do they have to be? It, it really depends. Uh, somewhere between five and 10 minutes feels like a good package. So it doesn't have to be this long thing. It doesn't have to be super short. But as we say in radio journalism and audio journalism, it has to be just the right amount of time and not a moment longer. And they and they have to be finished audio pieces, don't they? So this is you know you go out, you interview somebody, or you do it remotely, of course. And um, we want you to edit it down, put some sound effects in, put mm-hmm. some music that you have the license for in, and actually present it as a finished piece. Absolutely, and it doesn't have to be like the Ellie piece that we just heard. It doesn't have to be from the perspective of a dog. We have tons of different stories, what we call dog adjacent stories, that we feature here on Dog Edition. And so, if you're thinking about being a comper and uh, considering <laughs> entering a piece, listen to some old episodes of Dog Edition because we have such a variety of different things that are designed to appeal to dog lovers. That was actually going to be one of the things I would say. It actually makes the competition a little bit easier because you know. Mm-hmm. what you're required to do. So you're not entering it blind. You know exactly what you can listen back and get a feel for mm. what you should put in and everything else. And I think the other thing we need to make clear is that this is not just for people who, uh, say, have a podcast or are a radio producer. There are so many people with creative outlets. They might be YouTubers or they might make TikTok videos, but it's the same kind of discipline, isn't it? If you can make a really succinct little package telling a story, then this is for you. Absolutely. If you can tell a story and use the wonderful world of audio, this is something that you should consider entering into our 101 Dog Stories. And as far as coming up with ideas, I know there are loads on the website as well, aren't there? There's sort of ideas of the kind of topics that we want. But I did a little check earlier today. If you go into Google and you put dog into Google and you click on the news tab, there are so many dog stories. And obviously you can take something that someone else has maybe reported in a newspaper and turn it into an audio story, can't you? That's the secret of how we do things here at Dog Podcast Network. How is it? So, okay, sorry. No, exactly. I mean, there are just so many great stories and we try to give them voice. And what's wonderful about this piece and and so many things that that we cover is that dog lovers around the world are the same. And we are trying to communicate that. So this is a great opportunity if you live in North America or outside of North America or anywhere 
to share stories about dogs from your perspective, your region, things that listeners would really find kind of interesting. Because, of course, although we're talking about prize money that's in dollars, by the magic of internet money <laughs> transfers, we can send it anywhere in the world. So that's... We'll send it to you via PayPal. You, yeah. You'll get <laughs> well, it in whichever <laughs> currency you like. I was trying not yeah. to give PayPal a name check, but, you know, you've done it now. Yeah, it's exactly how we send it out. <laughs> That is it. Yes, it, it makes it quite easy. And um, I was also going to say that, you know, obviously we love hearing people's accents as well. So mm -hmm. if you can speak English, but you speak English with an accent, don't let that put you off. Because how beautiful was it hearing the accents on that last piece? The Swedish accent was mm. wonderful. Just like you I speak with an accent. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think technically, Jim, you speak with an accent. <laughs> I love that. That is so true. Okay, so for details, go to our website, dogpodcastnetwork.com slash 101, dogpodcastnetwork.com slash 101. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpup. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it. It's a strange thing to do, sprinkle this powder on my food, but I wouldn't have it any other way. My time with you is precious and irreplaceable, and I'm thrilled to be with you for as long as possible. Here's to puppy playtime and senior snoozes. <laughs> no matter how old I get, I want my ever pup. It just makes me feel good in this life and the next, and the next, and the next. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup every day. Welcome back to the show. Now, we heard from Ellie the experience she and her humans had getting through the borders on their road trip. But as I alluded to at the start of the show, things are constantly changing with this system of moving your dog from country to country, and particularly through the pandemic and after Brexit. Our coordinating producer, Ayla Anderson, went on a deep dive to discover what you need to know about travelling with your dog in the EU. And now, breaking news about traveling between the UK and the EU. Recent reports have told us that pet passports are no longer the hip new way to travel. Try an animal health certificate instead. Okay, so that's not really very accurate. As Claire said, the rules of pet travel are ever-changing. So the breaking news is basically always breaking. The rules and regulations are constantly in flux, so it is always a good idea to check multiple times before you plan on traveling across any borders with your dog. That being said, Brexit did cause a pretty big change in how pets and people travel between the UK and the EU. I decided to try to tackle the tip of the iceberg of this convoluted mess in this next segment. I'm Ayla Anderson, your rough and ready producer, sniffing out the complexities of border travel after Brexit. So a bit of background was in order here, for me at least. I was really unfamiliar with terminology. So the United Kingdom, or the UK, is made up of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. The European Union, or the EU, is the economic and political union between member states or different countries in Europe. None of this is to be confused by the term Great Britain, which is the UK minus Northern Ireland. So basically the island portion that makes up the UK. 
the UK joined the EU in January of 1973. And the whole purpose of creating the EU was this big step in fostering economic cooperation between countries after World War II. This affected trade and it abolished border controls between the EU countries. Brexit, or British exit, is the process of the UK leaving the EU, which officially happened in January of 2020. Would you just stay with me? Stay with you? What for? Look at us. We're already fighting. Well, that's what we do. There are a ton of politics that went behind this move, and I'm not even going to try to pretend like I know all the different reasons. But what does all of this have to do with traveling with your dog? Previously, when the UK was still a part of the EU, all you would need to travel from EU country to EU country was a pet passport. These passports were good for life, and they included all of the typical information that you would expect. Microchip numbers, description, owner's information, and rabies vaccines. However, after Brexit, the deal of abolished border control was completely changed. And with that change came a very complicated mess of pet travel. So now there are different sets of requirements whenever you're traveling from a country within the EU to the UK, from the EU to Northern Ireland, from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, and the UK to an EU country. Each set of these requirements is slightly different, but they're important because if you're missing just one of these differences, you will not be able to bring your dog across the border. I won't go into too much detail here, or I would be monologuing all day, but here are some examples of some of the differences. So if you are traveling from Great Britain to the EU, you have to pass through a designated point of entry city where you can show documentation. The EU pet passports no longer work when going between the UK and the EU. Instead, you need an animal health certificate, and that health certificate has to be issued by an official vet and it can be done no more than 10 days before your pet arrives. It's only valid for four months. And one of the problems with all of this is that these new requirements also apply to service animals. So it makes it even more challenging when you're traveling with a service dog, like a seeing eye dog. So the major takeaway is that if you are planning on traveling between the UK and the EU borders with your dog, constantly check the requirements needed. We'll include the links to the European Union's webpage and the government of the UK's webpage in the show notes for anyone who may be traveling. I'm Ayla Anderson with Dog Podcast Network. Well, that's interesting if you are traveling within Europe, but, you know, getting to Europe or even getting from the United States mainland to Hawaii can also be kind of difficult sometimes, huh? Yeah, you've got quite a lot of experience with this, haven't you? Because (laughs) am I right in thinking you actually managed to get the rules changed for bringing a dog into Hawaii? I was determined. So this is years ago. I was living in uh, Washington, D.C. area, and I had a dog named Maui. And Maui wanted to go to Hawaii because I wanted to go to Hawaii. (laughs) So... There was at that point a quarantine law in the state of Hawaii that had been on the books longer than the state of Hawaii had been a state. And it basically at that point was 120 days and then it moved down to 90 days and then 60 days and then 30 days. But basically you were putting your little dog in a quarantine station on Oahu and I would be on a different island on Maui and I could, I guess, go over and visit for a long period of time because they were very concerned about rabies. And I would not subject my dog to that. And it, of course, discouraged a lot of people from bringing their dogs to Hawaii. And so around 2002, 2003, I got together with a small group of people and we did something we called Who We Did Up. We we got a bunch of people together and we helped to change the law. Um, I grew up in D.C. and I grew up in the U.S. Senate, which is a whole other story. But we did a lot of political stuff to help change the law. We did end up changing the law. And so Maui was able to be one of the first recipients of the law after Governor Lingle signed it in 2003. And uh, she got to fly to Maui with no quarantine. So that's how committed I was to getting uh, my dog here in Hawaii without quarantine. 
And can I just ask, did you name your dog Maui in order to kind of emotionally manipulate the authorities in Hawaii to letting her in? No, she had been named Maui well before I even thought of bringing her, just because it was one of my favorite places. So oh, okay, I'll let you off. I just thought it was a clever thing that you were trying to do. It was a clever marketing thing. Yeah. No, no, no. But you're also running into some issues in terms of getting Maple back yeah, well, to England. Um, I should say that um, we came to Canada with a Canadian dog. Yeah. So yes, you did hear that right. So we, so 12 years ago, we had a dog in Alberta and then we took her back to Europe and then she went around Europe and then she went to Scotland and then she went to England and then we brought her back to Canada and then she finished her life here, which is sort of very poetic. It's kind of bookended with a year in Canada each end. Mm-hmm. And then we got another dog who we now have to take back to the UK. Mm. And we had sort of set our hearts on going back on the QM2 because did you know that they have kennels on the QM2? The QM, the Queen Mary. Oh, sorry, no, yes, I the, love Queen, the Queen Mary, yes. The Queen Mary. Yes. I love the idea of, of sailing back from North America to England and having kennels on board. What, what are they like? Oh, amazing. And they have kennel hands. So they have these guys in these really smart uniforms who take them out for a walk and they have a a deck just for the dogs. And they have a sort of like a, a room that if the weather's bad, the owners can go into with the dogs and play with them and make coffee. And it's, it's amazing. Oh. It's like a proper VIP experience, but hugely popular. Does this mean that Maple's not going to be treated to that? Well, apparently they get booked up about a year in advance and we only found out that we were going back to the UK like nine months in advance. So we tried and they said the waiting list is full and we're still sort of trying, just hoping that maybe somebody's going to drop out so we can go back that way. Oh, Um, fingers crossed. Otherwise it's cargo hold, you know, because, yeah, of course Maui, I'm guessing, and, and your other dogs have gone under the seats haven't they i have little dogs so yeah. they can go under the seats and they can they can do that but um you can't do that internationally i no. don't think with maple no so she has to go in Maple's her crate yeah and then in yeah. in the hold and i don't like that hugely um but it's sort of a necessary thing maybe we should reach out to uh <laughs> the queen mary people and say hey we need to get maple to come back to England in style. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, she's a very, very, very important dog. Um, she's part of the Dog Podcast Network, mm-hmm. obviously. She is. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it would, be, it would be lovely to do a report on it, but I, I think it would require somebody to, like, surrender their place, which people obviously do because their plans change. Mm-hmm. So if that happened mm-hmm. and there was a space, that would be amazing. Okay. Well, we will follow this journey, and maybe someone from Cunard is listening to this and may – find a spot or there may be a cancellation because I would love to hear what those kennels are like on traveling back to England in style. That sounds amazing. Well, that is all we have time for today. I want to thank you for joining us on Dog Edition. We will be back again with another episode, but chances are you will be going for a walk between now and then, and you'll want something good to listen to. And we have a lot of shows on Dog Podcast Network to help you. If you're interested in hearing more from some of our guests, then please check out our DPN sister show, The Long Leash, hosted by Jim for extended conversations. If you enjoyed today's episode of Dog Edition, then give us a follow on your podcast app. And if I could ask one thing, next time you're out on a dog walk, if you enjoyed the show, then just drop a little mention of it into conversation with a fellow dog lover, because that's the best way of growing the show. I'm Claire Mansell in Ottawa, Canada. And I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. From all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I want to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.